chilling tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's edition, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with two audio adaptations of frightening fiction about eerie encounters and sacrificial saviors. I'm your host, Paul J. McSorley. And tonight and every other Wednesday night, I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. Joining us tonight to bring life to the frightening fiction of Fox Feathers and Scott Savino is Rissa Montanez, Michelle Kane, Nick Goroff, Steve Taylor, and Olivia Steele. Now, get your ticket ready, take your seats in our theater of the minds, and brace yourself. It's time to... Turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Our first tale this evening is written by Fox Feathers and performed by Rissa Montanez, Michelle Kane, and Nick Garoff. Set in a world where supernatural creatures are quite normal and hunted as bounties, our main character hunts a creature hunting humans and finds herself in a situation she never really expected to be in. Now, without further ado, I present to you, Call Me If You Need Me. She was objectively pretty, I guess. That's the first thing I noticed, because that's generally the first thing I notice. Not really my type. I prefer sturdier stock. She was slender and willowy, with not a lot up top or down below. But her eyes were the color of the sky and her hair pitched dark, straight as a board and down nearly to her arse. It was tucked back in a no-nonsense ponytail, which made sense since she was waitressing. I hate it when waitresses have their hair down. Makes me think about all of it shedding into everyone's food. Her cheekbones could cut glass and her lips were full and thick. Not really my type, but objectively pretty. Made it all the more a shame. Not my type, but I'd have had fun making her scream for another reason entirely at the end of this. Leaving her with something better to remember me by than what was going to go down in here. I pushed aside my empty plate, just pie and coffee. Couldn't do this on an overly full stomach and I sat back, scanning the restaurant. I'd picked a small mom-and-pop place, not too tiny but small enough that the kerfuffle about to ensue wouldn't make major news. The food was good too, which was a bonus. Great pie. Better coffee. And I'd miss it. She noticed me watching her. Those sky eyes flicked towards me and away again almost immediately. Not a fighter. She didn't want conflict. That was as obvious as it was possible for it to be. Fight or flight would kick in and she'd pick flight. Every time. Everything about her added to that impression. Good. That meant she'd listen. She'd be meek and spooked and she'd do whatever I told her to do. She'd be easy to handle when things got crazy. 
The little bell above the door rang, a cheer for a little noise, morbidly just opposing the scene that was about to go down. He was here. Showtime. The door closed and the little bell rang again, and I moved in towards the girl. She saw me move towards her, and after a step or two, began gathering up the cups and plates left on the table she'd been preparing to clean faster. She wasn't a fighter, but she also wasn't stupid. She knew something wasn't right here. Like a deer aware of a hunter. Not scared. Not yet. She didn't know there was a threat, but she knew there was something and she wanted to be away from it. Too late. I closed in on her faster than she could make her getaway, put one hand on her shoulder and pulled the gun from the waistband of my jeans. I made no attempt to be subtle, pointing the muzzle directly between those sky eyes of hers. They widened in fear and horror and, like the deer she was, she froze. What? Why? Someone screamed and I lifted the gun from the girl's face just long enough to fire a shot into the ceiling. People screamed, short and sharp, the alarm call of the human herd. A predator is here. A predator has one of us. Shut up and do not move. I didn't yell, just raised my voice, calm and authoritative. Anyone moves? Princess here gets a bullet. And we wouldn't want to ruin her chances at OnlyFans, would we? Wouldn't want to mess up that pretty face. I lowered the gun back down, motioned at the girl with it. Now come here, pretty. And do as I say. I won't hurt you if you do what I say. All flight. No fight. But for a second, something behind her eyes flared. Anger. Indignant. She did have a little spark in her. I'd have to watch out for that. But, like I thought she would, she obeyed. She moved where I could wrap my arm around her shoulders, keeping the gun positioned just so at the side of her head. Don't call me that. My name is... I have the gun. I decide what your name is, princess. She stiffened against me anger making her shoulders and jaw lock but she didn't have the balls to act on it I knew she wouldn't and you I added cocking my head at the cashier I know there's an emergency button under that countertop press it and I will blow your head off I don't want to hurt anyone but trust me I'm not of a delicate constitution about it then I finally turned, and I looked at him. He hadn't moved this entire time. Stood there just where he'd come in. The big, hulking lumberjack of a man. He was also objectively pretty. If I'd been into guys. I'd have said even my type. Big, Burly, with hands big enough to cover your entire damn face and hair the color of wheat. Or the sunlight at dawn. It hung, shaggy and soft, around a chiseled jaw lightly dusted with fine stubble, framing a friendly face that looked wrong without a smile. His eyes were cornflower blue, the whole look pulling together for that of a good old southern boy right off the cover of some cowboy harlequin. Objectively pretty. More the shame. He watched me watch him. And then finally, spoke. Come on now, miss. He said slow and low, meeting my eyes with an unnerving directness. His voice was silk over sandpaper, honey over gravel. And it rolled up my spine pleasingly. Come on now, miss. What's your name, love? As he spoke, a soft Scottish brogue entered the words. 
It hadn't been there at first. No one else would notice or remember it. If you asked any of them, they'd say he'd had it from the start. But he had it. He hadn't until he met my eyes, so directly. Until he'd gotten it. From me. I'm holding a girl at gunpoint and you think I'm just going to give you my name? My own accent was faint and soft. I hadn't been home in years and it showed. That makes sense, Hero. Sit down. He did not sit down. I didn't think he was going to. He stiffened instead. It was subtle. Like an animal preparing to pounce. As for my part... I relaxed. I needed to be loose for this. Not tense, not tight. No. The tension came from the people around me. The moment he'd tensed himself, the fear and panic of the crowd had shifted. I could feel them now, closing in, shoring up. They looked at him as if every word held the truth of the future and he could save them from any threat. With adoration and admiration. They looked at him like someone they would do anything for. Like he could tell them anything and they'd swallow it up. It was slow. Like a spreading wave. The people closest to him were getting it first. Then slowly outward. I'd picked a small place for this and I was glad I had. I'd only have to deal with five, maybe six patrons if anyone decided to pull any crap. Plus, one or two staff. He, meanwhile, seemed to get a little taller, a little broader. He didn't see me notice it. He didn't see me seeing him watching him drink in their admiration, their fear. Literally, growing stronger from it. I see a young lady who seems to be in a desperate position. Desperate enough to threaten an innocent girl. He gave me a smile that was supposed to be reassuring. That for anyone else who didn't know better, would have been. But you're more than just some thug, aren't you? You have no idea. Why don't you let her go now? Huh? What is it you want? The opening could not have been better if it had been scripted. You! I hissed, and the jaws of my trap snapped shut. I saw him realize it. Like the girl I held against me had realized she'd been in the gaze of a hunter earlier. He saw it now. His eyes went wide, and he bore his teeth in a vicious snarl. Hunter. He growled then. No! The word left him like a punch. It sucked the air out of the room, out of my lungs, and simultaneously, the girl in my arms began to squirm and writhe. I'd picked her because she was meek and soft. Flight, not fight. Avoidant, fearful. I'd picked her because she'd been the target with the best chance of two things. One... Drawing in an emotional vampire with a literal need to be needed. She was frail and weak. Or seemed to be. A beautiful damsel in the middle of a public place. He'd be drawn in like bees to a flower. The idea of that much adoration and respect. Coupled with the fear and panic of the situation. It was a buffet. Two because her innate lack of desire for conflict would, hopefully, override the way he exuded, demanded that anyone in the radius of the building fight for him, protect him. My gun would keep most of them at bay, anyway. But her, I needed nice and calm. Yet here she was, squirming, I swore between gritted teeth, shifted the gun, and did something you should never, ever do. I swatted her upside the back of the head with the butt. I could have shot her. I should have shot her. 
been done with it, put myself at less risk, but as she twisted in my grip, her sky eyes met mine. They held this time. Held for a long moment. She really was very pretty, objectively. At that moment, with fire in her. So I knocked her out cold instead of killing her. Pretty little thing like her, probably waitressing her way through college. She'd have worse hangovers. She'd be fine. She dropped to the floor like a spilled sack and I whirled to catch the fist of the cook that had emerged from the kitchen, who had, until this moment, been content to hover in the doorway, unsure what action to take. He wasn't unsure now. Now he was very, very confident that he wanted to break my nose, which had been broken quite enough times, thank you very much. I'm not a small gal, but... This guy was built like he wrestled bears for a living instead of flip burgers. He sent me backwards, crashing into a table. I staggered, and couldn't avoid the second blow. This one from the man who had been eating breakfast with his wife, just a few tables over from me. It caught me in the jaw and sent me to the floor, and only a quick jab to his Johnson with my boot kept him from landing on top of me. I rolled up, grabbed my gun again, and fired two more times into the ceiling. It gave a few of them pause, natural human fear overcoming their deep, barely recognized desire to protect this man who they just met. He hissed, like a snake or a cat, and dove for the door in the chaos. I took advantage of the pause I'd created to draw down on the creature. He turned and was halfway back out the door, the little bell ding-ding-dinging in that obnoxious, cheerful way. Easy target. I was a damn good shot. And the bullets in this gun were designed very specifically to kill things like him, each with a little symbol carved into them. A little spell. I fired. Bang on. I was a good shot. The bullet hit squarely in the middle of the chest, piercing the heart of the girl with the sky eyes. My world reeled. My heart clenched. My breath whooshed out of my chest like it had when I'd been little. A kid and struggling with asthma. A fist around my lungs. My world went red at the edges. I wanted to say that it was the empathetic vampire that made me feel the white-hot rage, the gut-twisting nausea. I wanted to say I didn't give a shit that she had come around without me noticing. That woozy and weak. She'd been particularly vulnerable to his influence. Didn't care that I hadn't noticed her make it to her feet. Hadn't noticed her lunge. Throw herself in front of the empath. That he'd used her as a human shield and made me kill an innocent girl. I wanted to say I didn't care. That he forced the rage out of me like he forced the emotion out of everyone else. Humans were slow. Stupid. Clumsy. Blind, deaf. And dumb. I hated other humans. I didn't care. But I knew that was wrong. I knew it because, thanks to the necklace around my neck, under my shirt, he could not do anything to me. Stupid, stupid, stupid. You should have been paying attention. You should have paid attention. This was a fucking stupid idiot as plan. You fucking stupid idiot. I heard myself shouting with rage. The smirk on his face vanished as he heard it too, and assumed the oh-shit look of any child who had pushed a parent too far. He dropped any attempt at control over the people in the diner, but I was barely aware of them reeling, of someone puking right near me. I think someone may have screamed. There was crying. 
It all seemed very far away as I pulled the trigger again in rapid succession before he had time to get out the door. I was. I am. A damn good shot. Once through the leg. He staggered, his knee exploding from behind. Once through the center of the back. He dropped like a stone, making a wailing noise as he did so, screeching like a wounded animal in the jaws of a lion. He knew he was dead. Still, he was defiant, prey lashing out one last time before their throat was opened and their life spilled out. Fuck you, Hunter. You're a little bitch, but I like him prettier. I snapped back, panting, and I kicked him over onto his wounded spine to get access to his chest. Nobody in this fucking shithole move or I swear to God, I will kill you all. I added, raising my voice. I knew, without having to look that now that her mind was hers again, that the cashier was going for her phone to try and call 911 or for that emergency push button again, maybe. She froze, mid-move, also sensing that I had been pushed too far. Ma'am, you don't have to do this, someone said to my left. No one else has to die today. Please. It was cute to me. How many people wanted to try and help me. How many thought they could stop me by making me feel remorse or pain. No. (laughs) No. If anything, I was more determined than ever. You little hunt. He rasped out, laughing, spitting blood. Got a girl killed. Good job. You got me. That was you. Not me. I snapped, cocking the gun. That was you, you son of a bitch. And the last person you are going to hurt. Don't hurt anyone. Killer. Liar. He was. He manipulated people for his own gain. Used them for what he wanted. Took their emotions and fed on them. He caused the suicide of two teenagers by the time I'd even taken his case. Used them and tossed them aside like so much dirty laundry. Emotional vampires are, ultimately, the least dangerous threat a hunter can face. About all they can do is manipulate people's emotions and feed on said emotions. The problem comes in with what that causes in people. Suicide, obsession, PTSD, trauma. It leads to things like rape and unwilling accomplices in crimes. And it causes people to launch themselves in front of a bullet. He didn't get to retort. I pulled the trigger. And my bespelled bullet found his heart. He didn't die fast or easy. They almost never do. I didn't watch. It didn't give me any pleasure. Not even now. I put the gun back in the waistband of my pants. Turned to face the stunned, terrified patrons of the diner. I got what I wanted, I told them, in the silence of the room. Call the cops now if you want. They won't find me, but I might find you, if they try. I hold a grudge, you know, and I'm sure at least half of you have families. A young couple to my left clutched each other, her hand going to her belly. I leered at them to rub the point in. So maybe, be a good little sheep and pretend you never saw anything here today. I don't want to have to make good on this very direct, 
very real threat. I motioned to the door. Get out. Go home. No one moved. Fucking idiot sheep. Frozen in fear and panic. A deer in headlights. Humans. Get the fuck out! I roared it this time, and it worked. The flood of panicky, scared people rushed past me, out the doors, stumbling and tripping over the body of the vampire. I leaned against the counter behind me, pulling a pack of smokes out of my shirt pocket and lighting one up. Yeah, I know I said I had asthma as a kid. As a kid, you know? Besides, my lungs were lowest on my list of things likely to kill me. The herd jostled me as they rushed out, some sobbing, others stone-faced, in shock, others just looking exhausted and drained. They were, rather literally. Still, others looked at me with rage, hate, anger, and I grinned at them lazily. Gonna do something about me, tough guy? My grin said. And they always answered by flicking their eyes away and moving on. People aren't usually as tough as they think they are. And even if I didn't have a gun, even if I hadn't just shown them I was willing to kill, their instinct, their subconscious, told them I was a little bit out of their weight class. It didn't take long for the diner to empty. Like I said, it wasn't a big one, and there weren't a lot of people inside. In just five or six minutes, there was nothing left but myself and two dead bodies. I sighed, heavily, stubbing my cig out on the countertop. Story of my life. Me and only dead bodies for company. I sighed, glancing up to the ceiling. God damn it. There was something like a hundred bucks up there in plaster and wood at that fucking ceiling. I'd expected to fire off a shot for attention and show that I was serious. That was almost always how hunts in public locations went. So I'd prepared for the cost of that one. But two more in the damn ceiling, and then one that had hit. Well hit someone it wasn't supposed to. Three. Three wasted shots total. Three! Bullets like mine aren't cheap. And now there were two. Just poof, gone. Fucking stupid empath. Wasting my time and my money. I moved over to the vampire, who was no longer so much as twitching, and for good measure, I gave him a swift kick in the head. Asshole. Asshole! Bounty wasn't even fucking worth the loss. Slightly vindicated, I bent over him, pulled a knife out of my back pocket and carved a symbol into the small of his back. The sign for fire. Before I whispered the word to ignite the spell, literally... I used the knife to carefully, gently, remove the pinky finger from the vampire's right hand. Proof. In theory, you could just cut the finger off any old Tom, Dick, or Harry and claim you'd brought down a beastie, but there were ways to test and check for that. Anyone who put bounties out on these creatures had access to those spells. You just had to bring them something to use them on. I like taking fingers. Or sometimes, claws. Small and easy to carry, not conspicuous. Plus, a few of my clients have told me they're one of the easier things to test. I wrapped the finger in a small square cloth from my back pocket, then whispered a single word towards the body. Ignite. The word I use doesn't matter. I could have said fucking burn, you manipulative bastard, and he still would have burst into flames. It was the spell I carved into his skin that counted. 
I pushed back to my feet, slipping the wrapped finger back into my pocket and sighed. I would have to do the same thing for her. For the body of the beast, this was easy. Like disposing of trash, cleaning up after yourself. But her... Those last moments she'd been alive passed before my mind's eye. Her eyes were lighter still, when she'd been full of fire like that. Her full lips parted slightly as she panted, her long, slender neck arched trying to escape my grip. I shook my head, pushing the images away. Didn't matter that she was pretty. Didn't do anyone any good to think of her like that, but in an entirely different scenario. She wasn't my type, anyway. What are you doing? Jesus, Mary, and Joseph! I jumped half a foot in the air, gun in my hand before I could stop myself, pointing unerringly between the eyes of... Hi. She smiled and waved. Please don't shoot me again. It really hurt. How the hell are you alive? I demanded, not lowering the gun. I'd shot her. Right through the heart. I knew I had. I didn't miss. I don't miss. Not ever. I'd watched her go down. Watched the blood spread across her shirt. It was still stained deep red. She should be dead. Even if she wasn't human, she should be dead. Those bullets were meant to take down anything being shot through the damn heart. She shrugged, no fear on her face. She wasn't a fighter. That was still true. She didn't want conflict. Didn't want trouble. But she had no fear of the gun in my hand and no fucking wonder. I'd shot her through the heart, but here she was. Alive and well. I'd probably not give many fucks about a gun either. I don't know. It's not the first time, though. She reached up, put a hand gently on the barrel of my gun. Please stop that. Really. What were you doing? It's not your... I sputtered for a second, like a teenage boy being confronted by a pretty girl for the first time, tripped up by his boner. She wasn't afraid of me. Even if she wasn't scared by my gun, she should have been afraid of me. I just murdered a man. I've died like four or five times. She gave me a weak half-smile. It's never fun, but it never sticks. That bullet should have put you down, no matter what you are. I bit out. It's spelled and blessed. I don't know what to tell you. Her smile faded, fell, and something dark passed behind her eyes. I've been stabbed twice, overdosed once, got hit by a car, and... She stopped, lips thinning, and her eyes darted away. And other... other stuff. It never sticks. It hit me then. And for the second time in one day, that familiar old feeling of not quite being able to catch my breath hit me square in the chest. What was the first time? I asked, my voice coming out hoarse and raw. The... Why do you need to know that? She folded her arms over her chest, then grimaced and pulled them away from the sticky wet on her shirt. Was it bad? I ask, instead of answering her question. She froze, those beautiful pale eyes fluttering shut, her brow furrowing, and it was the only answer I needed. You always answer a question with a question? She asked, but I barely heard her quip. Revenant. She was a revenant. They weren't real. They had always been whispered about among hunters, among people in the know, but they weren't real. I had a friend who claimed she'd fought off a horde of zombies in a small town once, some place she called Gravity Drops or something. I don't remember. And I'd heard an old, old hunter once claimed he knew a guy who could bring people back to life. But only for a couple of minutes at a time, or... or something bad would happen. But neither of them ever had any proof. 
and most other hunters just laughed the stories off, as if they were just tall tales. It's not unusual for hunters to have big fish stories. In fact, it's pretty damn common. Not that I have any. Only the truth from yours truly. Swear on me, Mum. It was. It is. A catch-all word for anything not alive that's also not a ghost, ghoul, or vampire. You know, zombies or... Or in some stories, people who had died in bad ways who had regrets, anger, and refused to go out without getting revenge or finishing what they felt needed finishing. Usually, they came back as spirits. Angry ghosts. But here, now... The gun was suddenly quite heavy. And I let it pull my arm back down by my side. She breathed a sigh of relief and gave me another weak half-smile. Guess even special magic bullets can't kill me, huh? No. No one knew what could really kill a revenant. There were tons of speculations and thoughts, but because no one had ever hunted one, no one knew for sure. Shiloh, are you listening to me? Hello? Movement inches from my face. My hand snapped out, snagging the slender wrist, and I twisted, instinct taking over, bending the arm back behind her wrist, trapping it halfway up her back. She cried out, her knees buckling, and she hit the hard, crappily carpeted floor by the time I'd ever realized I'd acted. Hey, ow! I just... Ow! Let me go! Quickly stepping back and trying to pretend I didn't feel heat in my cheeks at the fact that I just manhandled someone who weighed 80 pounds soaking wet. Revenant or not, she wasn't any kind of threat to me and we both knew it. Rubbing her arm and shoulder, she turned over to flop onto her knees. Her sky eyes filled with anger and tears her slender chest rising up and down quickly with the fearful breathing of a cornered animal. What the hell was that for? I... Jesus, fuck, what is happening here? I'm sorry. I just... You startled me. You always attack people who scare you a little? Yes, actually. I pulled the cigarette pack out of my shirt pocket again, tapped out a second. I don't usually go through more than one so fast, but... Fuck if I don't need one. Maybe a drink, too. Usually, people who... Scare me a little... Are trying to take my face off, so... Point taken. She actually chuckled a little. Delicately picking herself up. She wrinkled her nose at the smell of my cigarette. And I lifted my eyebrows in a silent dare for her to say a word. She thought about it, but instead said, I was saying my name is Shiloh. Shiloh. Shiloh Sky Eyes. Shiloh Raven Hair. Shiloh the Undying. Shiloh. It was a perfect name. It fit her like a glove. Shiloh. I said it out loud this time, and it tripped and bounced off my tongue energetic and sharp. I'm Zane. Zane? She cocked her head at me. That's a boy's name. I laughed despite myself. The sound surprised me as much as I think it surprised her. I hadn't had that happen in a very long time. She smiled, though. Crooked and unsure. You know, I think you owe me a drink, Zane. She took a deep breath turned, and now, now she met my eyes without flinching, without looking away. She didn't see a predator anymore. I wasn't sure how I felt about that. I mean, after you shot me, and held me hostage, and also called me princess. As she got steam under her, I could start to see her personality. What she was under that scared deer persona. That fire she'd had in my arms was still there. Buried. Smothered. But there. Do you even drink? Or eat? 
I feel like that might be the same kind of question as how old are you or how much do you weigh? She retorted, lips thinning. She looked away, a light blush on her cheeks. I can, I don't have to. She pulled a shuddering breath and I watched her brace herself. Brave herself up. Put on armor to face me. Directly in the eyes again. Sassy and disaffected. But I could see the shadow behind her eyes. The way she held herself a little more tightly than someone who didn't care would. The way she kept trying not to look at the burning body on the floor. Or the gun in my hand. But also, she was eyeing me up and down. Her lips parted slightly. Her pupils dilated. Scared and turned on. I think the term for it is scare-roused. I chuckled to myself. I'd been told I was hot before. Usually by stupid drunk men right before I stole their wallets, but hey, it counted. On the plus side, I also can't get drunk. Which means, if I say yes, I mean it. Oh, well, that was damn forward. That's forward. Most people would be panicking and puking right now, by the way, princess. Your magic bullets couldn't kill me. I'm not most people, tough guy. She gave me a crooked, honest little grin. If you get to pull the stupid nicknames, I do too. I do need a nap, though. A long nap. Then we're going to talk about what happened in here. I need to talk about what happened in here. I wasn't totally surprised. She'd just seen a man die, and honestly, hunters were, are, rare enough that most people don't have experience with us. Don't get how it works. Shit. If Shiloh Sky Eyes wanted a chat before she let me bang her and we headed off on our separate ways, who was I to complain? At least I'd get something out of this. Not worried I'm going to try and find a way to off you? She stopped, and this time, her smile turned strained, and those Sky Eyes danced towards the ground. If you would, she replied softly, let me know. A lot of things I could have said to that. It was heavy. It was hard. She was born of a bad death and clearly haunted by her inability to die. Especially if she wanted to die in the first place. I got that. Knew what it was like to not see the point in life. To want to. I got it. A lot I could have said but only one possible option that made any sense to go with. I patted her, firmly on the shoulder, stepping over the now smoldering pile of ashes that was the vampire. Okay, Louis, I drawled, pulling open the door with a dramatic waist-deep bow. I'll be sure to finish you off as soon as you finish your memoirs. She blinked, then laughed softly. Surprised, pleased I hadn't pressed the issue. And I liked it. Liked her laugh. Her smile. It lit up those pale eyes and gave her little wrinkles at the corners of them. And her nose crinkled along the bridge. Her face went wrinkly when she laughed. And it was so imperfect and ugly and all the better for it. Does that make you Lestat? Last time I checked, Lestat wasn't planning to let Louis die. Her laughter faded, but the smile lingered as she studied my face with a slight tilt to her head. Maybe not. She murmured and took my offered open door with a playful curtsy. As we stepped out into the fading afternoon light... The pale, pale eyes caught the sun and lit up like a fire had been started in them. They were so pale, they reflected the light and sent it back times a thousand. Perfect, pale mirrors. 
She smiled at me when she caught me staring, blushing despite herself. She really was very pretty. Objectively. I hope you enjoyed Call Me If You Need Me, as written by Fox Feathers, with the performance by Rissa Montanez, Michelle Kane, and Nick Gora. Our second tale of the evening is written by Scott Savino and performed by Rissa Montanez, Michelle Kane, and Olivia Steele. In it, we meet a woman caught in one of the worst situations possible an unsafe partner. Now, without further ado, I present to you, True Love Burns Twice as Hot. The first week of October signaled the end of the hurricane season. Or at least it should have. We were passed over by nearly every storm before Hurricane Patty hit us. That's what Hayden said it was called. I never saw the reports. I wasn't allowed to watch the news. Only Hayden was allowed to use the TV. She's a big bitch, she told me. Bigger on the radar than the state of Texas. Shit, that's almost as big as you, Emma Jean. That's very funny, hon, I said as she laughed. According to her, I was getting fat. And there were new ways every day to remind me of it. I tried not to let her know what she said hurt me. I'd learned real quick to keep all that pain inside. And really, I was eating very little. How long till dinner's ready? She said, setting off all kinds of alarms in my head. Her tone held a warning. I knew I moved too slowly in the kitchen, but flipping the eggs with my wrist sprained was hard. The cast iron was too heavy, and the eggs were sticking something awful. As far as cooking went, mine was shit. I never understood why she didn't cook if she would complain about it every damn day. Before I could say anything about dinner, though, my phone rang from the coffee table, stalling her wrath for another minute. Hayden hissed in annoyance and answered with her friendly voice. I never heard that voice anymore. It had been taken. Replaced by something nasty. Something full of venom. Hello? Oh, yeah, she's here, Mr. Green. Let me get her for you. She stomped across the living room floor to where I was in the kitchen and held the phone out for me to take. I looked at her for a minute, searching for the trick. It's your daddy. She's just shoved the phone at me. As I took it, she grabbed my breast and twisted my nipple hard. I tried not to wince. You know the rules, she whispered into my ear. Her breath was hot and full of beer. Make it quick. Got it? I nodded as she let go. Hi, Daddy. Hi, Pumpkin. How you been? It was good to hear his voice again. Oh, nothing. Just cooking dinner, I said. Emma Jean, I asked how you been. No, Daddy, we're not evacuating. It'll probably just blow right over. Please, Daddy, understand. Last time I tried this, he said I must be drunk or high and hung up on me. This time, he was quiet. I was about to give up hope when he finally said, Imogene, is something wrong? Oh, bless you, Daddy. My heart was racing as I said, uh, Yep. You sent me a present for my birthday? Said it was returned to Sander? That sure is strange, Daddy. Are you sure you sent it to the right address? I prayed a silent prayer that he'd finally understood this time. The last two times, he hadn't. Hayden was scowling again. She made like she was watching TV, but 
I knew all her attention was actually focused right on me, listening to what I said. From the corner of my eye, I could see her watching me from the corners of hers. Is it that girl you've been seeing? She doing something bad? That's right, Daddy, I said. You got a pen? What do I need to do? You got your pen yet? I said again and paused for a moment. Well, you ain't gonna remember the address in your head, silly. Go and get you a pen. I took the phone away from my ear and pretended like I was looking through it. When I looked up again, Hayden was right in front of me. Her eyes were dark and full of murder. I pretended not to notice. What are you doing, baby? Her tone had kind of a poison sweetness to it. Like a wasp's honey. Lately, I'd come to know that tone of hers all too well. How do I find her address in this, Haiti? Daddy wants to send me a birthday present. It ain't in there. She snapped. Her eyes blazed further, red and wide. The silent threats of death just grew, and I could feel them all pressing against me. Oh, I said, calmly returning the phone to my ear. No, it ain't the phone, Daddy. Hold on. I looked at her and said, Can you tell me what it is so he can send my present? She didn't reply. Be blank, I willed myself. No emotions, Emma Jean. I said, Actually, Daddy, our dinner's burning, so I gotta go. I'll send the cops. Daddy whispered. I tried not to smile. I'm going to give the phone back to Hayden and she'll tell you the address, okay? If I thought before that she might kill me, then from the anger in her look, she was certainly fixing to after we hung up the phone. This would for sure earn me another night in the closet instead of on the couch. I love you, Emma Jean. Don't you cry. Don't you cry, Emma. Do not fucking cry. I love you too, Daddy. Here you go. Handing back the phone, I returned to the stove, where the pan was slowly spewing smoke. I moved it from the burner, grabbed another, and began making breakfast for dinner again. I was surprised when she actually told him the address. Of course, she only did it because I forced her to. If she refused, she'd have thought he'd become suspicious. I cooked more quickly this time, thinking that if I did well enough, I might actually escape punishment, but I was wrong. When dinner was done cooking, Hayden pulled me by my bad wrist to the closet and told me I shouldn't have mentioned anything about the storm to Daddy. She seemed awful mad about it. Sit, she commanded throwing me down to the floor. She snapped a shackle around my ankle and tucked the key inside her pocket. Took out the knife she kept on her belt and held it inches from my face. The light in the hall glinted off the blade, off of her eyes, as she reminded me how easily she could put an end to me. More and more, I wondered whether I wished she would or not. She wasn't always like this, though. We were happy in the beginning, just like everybody else. She'd been thoughtful and and kind and instead of mean and spiteful. We spent a lot of time in that period of bliss. You know, that patch of time where you learn everything there is to learn about a person. Where you see someone's true colors shine through. Even after the bravado of dates one and two wear off. I fell for her there, and I fell hard. When she wasn't with me, my thoughts always led me back to her, to all of the stupid little things a person does that she did. 
There was that coy motion she did with her hand, the one where she twirled her hair while she was thinking hard about something, and the way her smile reached up past her eyes each time I made her grin. Other times, I couldn't stop remembering the sweet and horsey sound of her laugh. It wasn't like anyone else's laugh I'd ever heard. It might have annoyed any other person, but to me, it was like music. I knew I'd never felt like that about anyone before. Eventually, I realized that though she did all these little things for the wide world to see, I was the only one who ever saw them in such a way as if they were special. I remember this one day we were driving. We didn't have anywhere in mind. We were just going to be going. And she slammed her brakes all of a sudden. The Jeep was all screeching tires and burnt rubber and we stopped in the middle of the road. For a minute, I was so confused. I didn't see anything worth stopping for and no other cars were on the road besides us. But then she got out of the Jeep and disappeared in front of it. And when she reappeared, well, that was the day I knew for sure that I loved her. Because when she reappeared, she was holding that little snapping turtle as it flailed its arms and legs and craned its neck back, trying and failing to bite her. And she just laughed her beautiful horsey laugh and, and said, I'm trying to help you, you silly thing. <laughs> then she set it in the brush beside the road and nudged its little tail softly and let it saunter away. She hadn't been that woman for a while now. The Hayden I lived with now was someone else. Someone I didn't know and hadn't ever loved. Someone whose eyes smoldered like an angry brazier in the dark instead of lighting up like stars. All the kindness was drained from her, and the warm light that drawn me in had all but flickered out. I'd known Hayden had some powerful magic inside her from the start. From when we'd met six months ago. There's some stuff in me too, but nothing like what she's got. For me, it's like a feeling in my gut. Not like most people get. Most people, it's a hunch or a hope they call their guts talking. With me, I could take one look into someone's eyes and know a whole mess of things that I shouldn't. Then I sometimes see other things around a person. Auras and the like. The energy that Hayden glowed with when I met her was this pale yellow sunshine that danced like a new flame. It was comforting and warm. I couldn't take my eyes off of her. The first time I saw her that way, I took it as a sign that the things she said and felt for me were true and pure. I could hear it too, vibrating in the air around me like little bells tinkling out a song nobody else could hear but me. I ain't seen or heard that energy from her for a while. Something bad happened. I think the aura that swirls around her now is this brooding it's thick as smoke and dark as sin something changed when she met those others with their help she learned more about her gift at first, I thought it was a good thing that she could learn new things that I couldn't even begin to. At first, they just practiced simple charms, stuff to make the world brighter and more hopeful than before, like making flowers bloom and turning gloomy gray skies into great, cloudless stretches of eternal blue. Over time, though, those pretty little charms got bigger. 
turned into things no one should have known how to do. Things that scared me down to my guts. I don't blame Hayden for what happened to her. I don't blame the other two either. They weren't bad. Not really. Because sometimes for some people, seeing they can do something incredible isn't enough. They want more. They want to see what else it is they can do and how far the envelope can be pushed. But a growing power like that changes people, takes them over. It corrupts them. I think something out there must have seen their light, the way they glow when they work together, and was drawn to it. I think they must have been tricked into opening doors that weren't meant to be touched. I think something came through one of the doors, and I think it never left. I think it lives inside Hayden now because whatever looks at me through Hayden's eyes anymore, well, it ain't my Hayden. Sometimes I get the feeling she's in there still. Sometimes I hear those bells I used to hear and the air vibrates with her love, but then it stops and that brief little breath of warmth around her turns cold and when I do see that yellow light of hers it flickers so weakly almost snuffed out in a heartbeat she never did tell me how it happened but she did make me help her clean it up one morning I woke up after Hayden had had her new friends over for something special Something she wouldn't say nothing about. Something with candles and symbols painted in red and the smell of something sweet and rotten hanging in the air. They were dead when I woke up. The both of them. The others. And I knew right away she wasn't my Hayden the second I saw her. It wasn't even the fact that her friends were dead that did it, though. It was the way her smile reached up past her eyes when she told me about them. And her aura turned black as night. Then, that thing inside her made me help her bury them in the yard, out by the driveway, beneath the big trees. That was the day I started to be the reason for the bruising on her hands. The day that thing used her voice to be cruel to me for the very first time. And I couldn't get away from it. I was afraid of what it might do if it knew I could see it for what it was, so... I pretended I didn't know it was there. That was three weeks ago now. The night I talked to Daddy, the night she put me in the closet again... I heard her chanting from the living room. It didn't sound like her voice, but nobody else was in the house, so I knew it had to be her. I didn't understand the words from my corner of the closet as they came through. They were muffled and low, but I could hear the wind picking up outside. I could hear the trees around the house were creaking and groaning up something fierce, and some of the larger branches just crackled in the distance and joining in the noise as they broke away. I was scared when I realized Hayden, or the thing inside her, had been right about Hurricane Patty. That it was coming right towards us. But exhaustion and fear were like pills and wine, and eventually I passed out in the dark with our coats and overshoes for company. I woke up sometime later, when Hayden was uncuffing my leg. I'm going out, she said, walking away. It was dark outside of the closet. And the stormy night beat at the walls and windows, blustering enough noise to wake the dead. I could hear it raging beyond. 
It was bigger than before I had slipped. While I'm gone, you're going to clean up. Ain't she scared I'm going to run off? I thought as I dragged myself out of the closet and down the hall to the kitchen. I needed a glass of water more than anything. Somewhere in the bedroom, Hayden laughed. It wasn't sweet or horsey. You ain't going no place in the storm, Emma Jean. You're too chicken shit to try. Was she reading my mind? Even now, I can't really say. Seems to me like she'd have known I was thinking that very thing, magic or no magic. And, as if to punctuate her point, lightning struck just outside the kitchen window, pulling a shriek from my lips as it blinded me. Then it struck again, shaking the house to its bones, and I gasped. When it struck again, in nearly the same place, my heart was about fixing to quit. What kind of hurricane can do all that? I wondered as thunder rolled around us. When I could see straight again, the clock on the microwave read 9.04 a.m. But the outside world was stark as midnight. Maybe darker. Hayden came out from our bedroom wearing a long black raincoat and a pair of overshoes from the closet. She took her keys from the hook by the door and both our phones from the chargers. Everything disappeared into a jacket pocket before she did up the coat buttons. She was right about me staying here. And the worst part was, we both knew it. I wouldn't leave. Not during a hurricane. I didn't know these woods. And the sky was constantly kissing the ground, and the trees, and everywhere else. The wind howled, screaming like the dead brought back, and the rain came hard and mean like stones on the roof. Sharp and angry. Do they know how long the hurricane's supposed to be for? I asked her. But she didn't answer. She just locked the door behind her with a soft snick from the bolt. I couldn't open it from the inside without a key. I turned to watch the storm wash everything away outside the windows as Hayden made her way to the car. That's how I saw them, before she did. Not that it would have helped her if she had seen them first. She never stood a chance. They were climbing out of the graves in the yard beneath the big trees. The lightning must have woken them from their death. Or awoken something else. Or maybe they'd been kindled by the promise of revenge and the fire of their hate. They didn't look how they were supposed to. Their hair was gone, and great black voids had eaten up where their noses and eyes should have been. Most of their faces were made of wide, yawning holes full of teeth. Teeth that they shouldn't have had. Even from way back in the house, I could see row after row of them chawing away as they spiraled down into vacant black throats. They ran to where Hayden was getting into her jeep. It didn't look like she could hear them over the sounds of the storm around her because she never turned around. The two of them reached her with an evil speed, and the taller one leapt up on her shoulders, wrapping its spindly legs around the front of her neck and torso. Its feet were gone, replaced by thin claws with too many joints that branched out into sharp, hard points. They dug trenches in her sides that wept gallons of blood in the rain. The shorter one's hands were the same. It used them to dig inside her, burrowing in through her stomach. They pulled out her guts, ripping them from her body and passing them up like sausages to the other one on her shoulders. As Hayden fell to the ground, they started tearing chunks of her away using every set of teeth that they had. When they were done, all that was left was a heap of meat full of a hundred craters made by mouths with too many teeth. That's when the tall one lifted what was left of her from the mud like she was nothing and pitched her way up into the treetops, 
like a bullet thrown away a little girl's rag doll. Except Hayden was the rag doll. And then they turned to me. I snapped the curtain shut and hid further in the house. They could get in, could they? I didn't think they could get in, but after a while, as the storm beat the house and they just groaned outside the walls, I wondered why they ain't trying the door or smashed out a window to come in. Something must have been stopping them, I reasoned. That was the only explanation I could find. I waited a few days, I think, being trapped inside as they moaned about just on the other side of whatever room I hid in. After about the third day of the storm, I remembered Hayden's tablet. It still had the internet. I could reach out to somebody. I could get out of here. First, though, I needed to know some things like when Hurricane Patty was supposed to end. Was it no one on Earth going to get to me if that storm didn't let up? I need to know when to tell my daddy to come and get me. And, come to think, three days was an awful long time for a hurricane. I've lived in Florida my whole life, but there hasn't been one storm that lasted this long. Storms always pass within a few hours, a day at most. Three? That just wasn't natural. So, I looked up the storm online. I tried all kinds of combinations of hurricane, patty, and Florida storm. But there wasn't anything on Google about it. No results. There was no hurricane patty. Anger boiled inside me for a hot minute when I realized that that thing must have made it all up just to keep me here. But that kind of anger don't last long when you think too hard. When I realized that if Hurricane Patty had been made up, and that thing inside Hayden must have summoned this awful wind and rain itself, it couldn't undo the spell since it was gone. And all that hot anger just spilled out of me, leaving nothing but cold and tears behind. I reached out to Daddy on social media. I didn't know what else to do. Daddy was awfully glad to hear from me. He said there was nothing at the address Hayden had given him and that the police had tried to triangulate our last call, but it hadn't worked. I said it looked like the call had come from a shopping center somewhere, but there was nothing like that near me. Before we said goodbye, he said they were still trying to trace the phone. But I didn't think that that would work. If my phone hadn't been smashed when those things had eaten Hayden then it had to be dead, either from a dead battery or the wetness of the rainstorm. And those others were still out there. They might have saved me from Hayden, but I knew that didn't make them my friends. I'd listened to them for at least five days. Or was it a week already? I lost track of time in the rain and the night that never ended. I had to ration my food and measure time and crumbs, but I was hungry all the time anymore and still didn't know what day it was. My rhythms got all turned about, too. I stopped sleeping almost altogether. All I could get was a few minutes of shut-eye here and there. It wasn't for a lack of trying. Of course, I'd been trying. I just couldn't do it. Those things just made so much noise. I listened to them all the time. What else did I have to do? Wondered how much longer I'd keep listening before I'd lost my head. At first, it was just the noise of their house. But then the noises started making sense. They claw little pictures in my brain, scratching them in like cave drawings. Some awful dark scenes were etched just behind my eyelids so I'd see them even if I squeezed my eyes shut. Didn't take me long before I knew what they wanted. It wasn't about revenge. It'd never been about revenge. They just wanted to eat. They were just as hungry as me. 
I kept telling myself I'd rather die there inside than enjoy them in the wet and dark. But they were working hard to change my mind. I'd think about doing it, you know? About running straight out there, stopping beneath the rain and the trees that swung about in the wind and just waiting for them. Every time I'd shove the thought away, it just forced its way back inside my head again. Sometimes, when I'd find myself feeling brave enough to, I'd peer through the curtains at them in the dark. When they weren't stalking the house, they'd claw through the dirt, rooting around to find other things they might could eat. But the only things I ever saw them find were frogs and worms. I never saw any other living things move around through that window. The only things moving outside were the hungry wraiths and the old trees swinging in the wind. Most every other critter must have taken shelter away from the storm. I wondered if those critters were okay. I was wondering just that when I saw something else outside. Something I missed before. I was in the kitchen, boiling up a pair of Hayden's old sandals and a belt I'd scrounged up from a forgotten drawer. I'd run out of food completely two or three days before, so I was just going to eat the leather. I'd never done it before, but I knew you could if you didn't have no other choice. I imagined it was going to be awful. I sat at the window, miserable and hungry, nodding off to the drone of the storm and the howling of the wraiths on the other side of the house when I saw them. They were just lying on the ground next to her car, right out there in the mud, in the wide open. The keys to Hayden's Jeep. My heart thumped in my chest like an angry preacher pounding on the podium. I could make a run for it. No, I thought. That's crazy. I knew I'd never make it to the car. Those raids would be on me in a second. Those keys may as well have been buried in the treetops with Hayden for all the good they'd do me. With a sigh, I stood, turning away from the window to tend to the leather suit boiling on the stovetop. As I did, the quiet sound of distant bells cut through the noise outside. As I turned back, the tiny hairs on my arm stood on end with goosebumps. Something crazy in me expected to see her, standing out there in the rain, bright as she'd ever been. But the scene outside the window was just the same as before. Cold, dark rain. I don't know why that disappointment hurt so bad. I had just been so sure, so positive. But of course, she wasn't there. She couldn't have been. I was about to turn away again when something in the trees caught my eye. A yellow light flickering someplace distant, like a flame. I could barely see it breaking through the wind and rain, but it was there. I knew that light. I'd have known it anywhere. It was her. She was burning like a fire out there in the storm. The true Hayden. My Hayden. Not that thing that replaced her. Before I knew what I was doing... I'd opened up that old kitchen window and climbed right out into the dark, walking toward the light like sun was pouring down instead of rain. It couldn't be coming from Hayden herself, I thought. Her body had been smashed up through the trees days and days and days ago. Hayden was dead. Her body was. But I still knew that light was her, sure as I knew my own name. It moved, too, dashing quickly in my direction and picking up speed as it went. It startled me. It made me think of a mountain lion streaking down a hill, and suddenly, I realized where I was. 
I was there. In the rain. Soaking in the cold. Outside. With them. I bolted for the car. My bare feet slipping in the mud. I couldn't go back inside. Inside there was nothing. Just loneliness and a slow, hungry death. But outside... When I'd already made it this far. I bounced off the side of the Jeep as Hayden's light reached me. Blinded by freezing rain and my own slick hair. I fished her keys from the mud and she passed through me. Into me. I felt the warmth of her wash away the cold October rain. The bells were singing around me, all loud and perfect and magical. Damn near took my breath away. I couldn't hear the wind over those bells, even as it threw the rain against me and tore at my dress. I couldn't hear the storm, even as it raged around me. I only heard Hayden. As I climbed into the Jeep, movement caught my eye. I looked up just in time to watch those dark creatures leap over the ridge of the roof. They must have been on the far side of the house when I came out. They landed in the yard, spraying mud into the air all around them, and they screamed over the wind. But the glow of Hayden's yellow light filled the space between us. I knew I didn't have any more time to waste. I started the engine and threw the car into reverse and drove away as quick as the rain would let me. Yellow light danced in the mirror, and I could see flames flickering behind me despite the storm. I watched those dark things light and burn and curl until they were too far behind me to see. The rain stopped when I found the main road out. The sky was clear and blue, like I'd never seen a storm in its life. As I drove, I saw smoke twirling into that clear blue sky from deep in the trees. At Daddy's insistence, I brought the police back to the house the next afternoon, knowing there wouldn't be anything left to find. The rain had stopped, and the house was gone. It had burned up that day until there was nothing left of it but a concrete slab full of cracks and smoldering ash. Police took me back to town, took my statement, such as it could be, and they sent me home to Daddy. I wish I knew what happened, really. I know it wasn't Hayden who kept me prisoner there, but something was wearing her face. Something happened to her that almost ate her all up inside. I think darkness has a way of devouring things. Same as fire. Things like hatred got a way of getting inside you and burning you away until you're something else something you don't even recognize but love can do the same thing even after you're gone the fire of love remains and me well I like to think that that sort of flame of true love burns twice as hot as any hatred ever could I hope you enjoyed True Love Burns Twice as Hot, as written by Scott Savino and performed by Rissa Montanez, Steve Taylor, and Olivia Steele. On to the shows. Longtime resident Otis Jiry has his very own show here on our network, Scary Stories Told in the Dark, which you can hear every Sunday night. We also have Eric Peabody's Horror Hill, a podcast dedicated to some of our deeper and darker tales. We hope you check him out. And Drew Blood's Dark Tales airs Fridays, featuring some southern down-home horror. And don't forget to check out the Fear from the Heartland archives, featuring more than 120 episodes. Well, friends, our weekly descent into the depths has just about come to a close. But before we go, 
I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us tonight and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host of the evening, Paul J. McSorley, and it's been a pleasure. Tune in again next week when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. <laughs>